I'll try to get it within the next few days up to the website. So I typed in Git Adobe Flash just in the main search bar, and now I click on Git Adobe Flash Player. And you'll see as it loads, install now. But when I click install now, it's, I wonder how our internet is. Shouldn't be too bad. There it goes, you see that little whoop? Well now up in the upper right hand corner, I have this little downward facing arrow. Everybody see where it is? If I click on the downward facing arrow and double click on that, it expands what it downloaded, and then I would just double click here and install Adobe Flash Player. And once it's in, it will automatically update itself. Apple does not include it because Adobe Flash Player doesn't play nicely. It's a huge resource hog. That's why you don't have it on your iPhone and your iPad because it would take your battery life down to about an hour. So that's the main reason. Smart web designers have stopped using Adobe Flash and they use what's built into the browser called HTML5 and that's the trend in the business. So within the next couple of years you won't need Adobe Flash Player. So don't download it to the iPad? You can't. Okay. Yeah, you can't. You can't really download programs. There's a way to do it on the iPad. If uh, There's some other weird apps that go out and they you actually peer into somebody else's browser and it does it that way. But you know what? Most of the stuff there you don't need it and it's it, it it would be terrible on an iPad. It would just, like I said, it'll make it'll make it heat up. It'll make your battery die in next to nothing. So anyway, so while I'm in Safari, let's do a quick little trip around Safari. Um, up at the top, you have this uniform bar that's both Google search and websites. So I can just type in there uh, Apple Pie. I can spell it right and then hit return and that's your Google search you've accomplished up there just by typing it in but if I type Apple you'll notice it starts to fill in a real website so since it did apple.com I hit return and it takes me directly to the website all right um, by the way uh, you purchased an Apple product if you have any problems with it you're welcome to use the Apple Store just like everybody else that's bought Apple products. You don't have to buy it from the Apple Store. Best thing to do is you make a reservation with the Genius. They'll spend up to 15 minutes with you, and it's wonderful. It really is. Don't you don't? If you bought extended warranty here, it's covered by extended warranty, but you get free service at Apple while your Apple warranty is in effect. So, and the Geniuses are pretty good. Um, they sometimes get pretty busy over there. But make a reservation, and uh, they can usually carve out 15 minutes or so, and they're pretty good. And to be honest, they actually do a pretty good job even after you're out of warranty. They're, they're very, you know, you pay what's called the Apple tax. You paid more for your Apple than you would for other PCs out there. But realistically, it's more, I don't want to say an investment, because everything goes down in price, but you've made a wiser choice than a PC because a PC after two to three years has virtually no value. There's no resale value at all. And it usually gets slow enough that you need to go buy a new one to make up for it. And Apple, people keep them two to three times as long. So right there, you've capitalized that money you spent. But secondly, all the applications that you have that came with it built in, you would pay for it in, other, in a PC. And, and the last thing is, there's resale value on it. Two to three years down the road, you can get half of what you paid back for. So, and it, it's a good quality product. So, yes, you paid more, but you got a much better product and the value is there. So, and, and the other thing is you can enjoy it. just can't hurt it. And on the internet, you don't have to worry. You can't get viruses. So you can just say, oh, I can do whatever I want. You can check all your emails. Don't, don't feel like oh, I'm going to break it or something's going to happen because it's not. You're, you're safe as can be because it's a modern operating system. Your iPhone and your ad, iPad cannot get viruses either. So if I want to take, you'll notice this bar across the top. If I wanted to go to a website, well, actually, let's go to uh, the MacNexus website, or this is my website. If I wanted this on my, on my top bookmark bar here, this little thing in front is called the favicon. I simply grab it and drag it down, and then I can just say, you know, test, make it short name, and boom, then it's there. Then if I go back to Apple, all I do is I simply go one click and I go back to that web page that was 
bookmark. It's kind of a bookmark, but it's really in the favorites bar. You guys from Internet Explorer, it's probably used to be called favorites. Okay, bookmarks is kind of a generic term on that. Safari is the best browser on the Mac, but you can you can't get Internet Explorer, but you can get Firefox. The new Firefox is okay. The other good browser is from Google called Google Chrome, and you can run browsers. All browsers are is what allows you to, to see the internet. Safari's preferred because it interacts with all the other Apple programs. So best to use Safari as your main browser, but there's an occasional time where you may have some incompatibilities, so you can go with Google Chrome also is probably the second best. And if you're still on a PC, Stop using Internet Explorer and use Google Chrome because it's much more safe and secure. So if you're still using a PC or know people that are, have them, use Google Chrome. It's free. So let me get rid of that. Okay. So any other questions on Safari? I mean, it's really pretty straightforward. It's a, a browser is a browser is a browser. Um, it does allow you to save passwords, and I highly recommend that. We're going to talk a little bit about, while, we, while you can't get viruses, there's still password security that's a big deal. And there's one end of the spectrum that's totally convenient. The other end of the spectrum is really, really secure. Where you choose to fall in there is your choice. If you have a password protection on your computer, then you're fine because you don't care what they do. But the Apple Safari will allow you to save passwords in what's called the keychain. And the really cool thing is, if I go to Amazon.com, and I tell it to save my password, I pick it up on my iPhone and my iPad, and it automatically fills it in there for you. The passwords propagate across all your devices if you're using Safari, and you allow iCloud Keychain to be on. And that's really cool. Other than that, any, so Safari, again, the big download is you, you, when you download something, click over here and just click on it. All right, so let me quit Safari for now. Oh, and by the way, I should mention this. So hitting the red dot won't quit Safari. You notice up by the, the Apple logo in the upper left, it shows you what program is currently the one that's in front. It says Safari. If I hit the red dot, Safari is still on, isn't it? It's unlike on the PC where when you click the upper right hand red X, it quits the program. This, on some Apple programs, it quits it. On the rest of the time, it just shuts, it just, um, allows it to run without a window. You can always tell what's running by the little, very subtle little white things underneath there. Two ways to officially quit a program would be to come up here and hit quit, but you'll notice that also all the keyboard shortcuts to there, command Q, or come down here and click and hold and say quit. Okay. Occasionally things will disappear. This is called the dock. We're going to go over some more of the doc, but occasionally these things, something will disappear from there. Don't worry, you haven't lost it. It's simply a shortcut. So if you lose a program like Safari or something, it's still in your applications folder and you can go get it. I'll quit this keynote. Now, this is the doc on the bottom. Now, if we open a Safari web page, let's say this one. I've got a lot of space here that would be usable to see what's going on here. If I'm editing a document, things like that. So this screen is built the same way I am. It's wider than it is tall. So how about, since you're brand new at it, let's go up to the Apple logo, come down to Doc, and say, oh, now it's out of the way. And look how much more room I have to do things. So if I hit the green dot, it'll expand to the rest of that. Again, I'll go back and show you this Apple logo, dock, position on the bottom. You can do it on the right also. I just have a, I gravitate to putting it on the left. To me, that's one, one thing you can modify in the very beginning that will help you later because you have plenty of width but not enough height. This would be something where if you guys set up separate users and you set it on the left for you but you didn't like it that way, when you flip from user to user, it would work. I, I explained to them, you can set up separate users on your computer. So you could have your user, she could have hers. You guys probably have separate email addresses. You might, you might want flowers on your screen. You might want an eagle on your screen. So you set up separate users, it's like two separate computers. 
Because there's always this apprehension of like, well, I don't want to download his file because it might mess up his stuff. Well, when you do separate users, you're completely isolated from the other person, so you don't have to worry about it. If you mess up anything, which you're not likely to do, you're only messing up your side. So to do, you, there's just Google how to set up separate users, and it's really quite simple. And also, you can password protect the other side. So if it's a parent and a child, well, in this case, the child has a computer. If you want to protect it from mom, you can set a password up. But the idea is, is that each user can have their own password, and to get into that other user, they have to do a password. So it's really safe and secure, and it doesn't really take up much extra room because everybody shares the applications, but everybody has their own data. So in other words, if you're making a word processing document, everybody uses the same application, but everybody has their own pool of documents. So something to think about. I set up separate users just for different things, like this is my Best Buy demo user, so it doesn't affect my regular user. All right, so that's Safari. That's the doc on the left. We're going to go down through the doc a little bit. First thing is the finder. It's always going to have a line on it. It's always on. That's what's running your computer. And I always say it's the smiley, happy finder face. So if you click on it one time, then you finally get the good old window of how to look at your files. Now, you'll notice there are four boxes here. This is how to view your files. I'm going to go into documents just to show this. So if I click here, it views it by icon. You see that? Which I think is pretty useless, but it does give you a preview of it. List view is kind of nice, and it's my preferred, because in list view, I can go ahead and say sort by name, sort by date modified, that's always the one. Hey, is this the most recent version of that thing I was working on or not? And each time I click on it, it changes the ascending to descending. So when I click on a column header, it means sort by that column, okay? That's in list view here. This is column view. Eh, if you like it, it's fine. I'm not too big on this one. Okay, and the last one is, oh, gives you a lot of fluff here. Let's go to documents. and Kind of gives you a preview as you go through these documents, you know. Boom, boom. But that's a lot of sizzle and not a lot of substance, I think. So this is the preferred. A lot of people prefer this one. The other really cool thing on the Mac We've all had this list of documents, and we've named them some obscure name, or we still call them untitled, right? So how do you know what's in that document? If I go up here, click on it one time, and simply hit the space bar, boom, it comes up. Oh, that's what that was. Now I've got arrow keys on my keyboard, so I'm going to move down one and watch what happens to the screen. Oh, it was the same PDF. There we go. And I went down one more. If this was a song, it would start playing the song even without launching iTunes. So how I get that is just spacebar. All documents, all movies, all video, or all videos, all videos and movies, and anything that can show up on there that's, that's a file, it will show up. So that's spacebar. And that's a great way if you're really looking, even like a bunch of photos you can go through. We're going to go over iPhoto in a minute. So that was Finder. The next one is a thing called Launch Bar. This will look really familiar if you're, like for your in iOS. These are all your applications. And you can see I have a few pages of them. Quite a few pages of them. Too many pages of them. And I can simply click on those and fire it up from there. So that was Launch Pad. The next one is Safari. We've already been over Safari. I'll come back to Mail. I just want to go through Contacts. That's your address book. Calendar. Notes we're going to go over briefly. Apple Maps. So you can still use Google Maps by going to a browser. You know, maps.google.com is quite good. But Apple has their own built-in maps. Uh, messages. You can text someone that has an iOS device from here. And on your iOS device, have you ever noticed you have some people that's blue and some people it's green on your texts? Green means it's a regular text message. They don't have an iPhone. And it's going over your cell carrier. The blue iMessage just means it's going over data and it doesn't go against your cell phone plan. And those people you can text right from your 
Mac. This is FaceTime. Uh, you can do video conferencing, but FaceTime also allows you just to do audio now. And yes, the Mac supports Skype just fine. So a lot of people use Skype out there. Uh, iPhoto we're going to go over in a bit. Photo booth, have you guys clicked on this yet? Yeah, kind of fun. It's a great entertainment thing. It uses your camera to take pictures of you, puts you in scenes. You can do different things like this. This is just great fun, and you can just have a great time with it. So I'll click on it. It's, it's really bad lighting in here. But I'm going to go over and just do an effect. Actually, if I boost my screen brightness, that'll help a little. X-ray, there we go. So, oh, light tunnel. That's one of my... So let's do... <laughs> the lighting's bad, but see this way, I'm green screened in over it, so... All right. Uh, you can capture it if you want to by hitting the red button, and then you can store it in iPhoto. That was Photo Booth. Pages, numbers, and keynote, these are built in. These are the equivalents to Word, Excel, and PowerPoint. And they're very cool. You can build a, you can build a, a word processing document or a spreadsheet in here and export it as an Excel or a Word document to send to people that are still using those on a PC. iTunes, we'll go over briefly. iBooks is not a big deal. The App Store, this is where you can buy apps just like on your iPhone. And in fact, you use the same iTunes account that you do on your iPhone. And I recommend the thing to do is when Best Buy has the iTunes gift cards on sale for 15% off, buy a bunch, store them so you have them, because then everything you buy is at a 15% discount and you can keep them on file. I happened upon a deal two mornings ago. I was up at 5 in the morning and I saw the deal site. You could buy $10 iTunes gift cards for 5 bucks. So I proceeded to buy 20 and then it got shut down. But it was, and it was reputable, it was through PayPal. So um, I banked as many as I could. System preferences, this we're gonna dive into a little bit quickly here, is this is the same thing as settings on your iPhone. It's the same gray gear that you have on your iPhone, your iPad. These are all the different places you can do things on your Mac to change it. One thing I really encourage, if you'll notice here in Safari, and if we go to this, I've got to turn it off because the way your ships is the scroll bar. Everybody remember the scroll bar, right? Well, the way Apple is trying to get you away from using the scroll bar. So as you move your mouse over to the scroll bar, it will disappear. Come on, disappear. It disappears. A lot of people still want that scroll bar. So, we go to System Preferences, and we click on General, and this will be on the recording, but I'm going to tell it to have the scroll bar always active. Now, when I go back here, the scroll bar is always there, and I can grab the scroll bar all I want. Now, have you noticed the scrolling is reversed? Anybody notice that? So, how many of your laptops? Okay. So... To scroll, you're using the trackpad or using the external mouse and keyboard? Using the trackpad on the middle? Okay. To scroll your screen, it's two fingers. So I just, I just slide my two fingers. On the iPhone, it's one to scroll. On the trackpad, it's two fingers up and down. Over the screen I'm on. So let me do this. I'm going to open another screen. And we'll go to this. So my mouse is over this one, and I can scroll my two fingers up and down, right? But this is, the, this is the one that's in front, this screen. But look, if I put my mouse over this other screen and it's not in front, I can scroll the page behind it, even though I'm not active on that page. And you just two finger on your trackpad up and down, and even right and left, OK? Two finger scrolling is really, really easy and important. Don't feel like you have to go grab that scroll bar anymore, but you still can if you want. Okay. Again, scrolling up and down. That's huge in Safari. So that was in System Preferences, and that was the first one. 
The other settings you can do is you can do desktop and screen savers. Realistically, screen savers like flying toasters used to be around for a while because the old type of CRTs, they used to burn in and you needed to have a moving image. Now you're better off just letting your screen go to sleep and go dark because it uses a lot less energy. You don't have to have a screen saver. They can be fun if you want. You can even have it reach in and use your iPhoto library. Most of the other things in here, there's not really a lot to speak of. Um, you do want to make sure you set up your iCloud account. It's kind of difficult, but make sure your iCloud account coincides with your iPhone or your, and or your iPad. Here is where we talked about adding separate users. This is how easy it is. You click on users and groups right here. And then we simply go, we unlock this. You have to have an administrative password. Unlock it. And then I can simply add a new user. And then when I go to add this user, I can give them standard privileges, which means they can't do pass and make up passwords and things like that. That would be for a younger child that you want to make sure they can't get in and tweak things. But most of the time, you're going to just make it as an administrator password. There is a section to do manage parental controls, but that's tough. It works somewhat, but you know, the younger kids know the way around these things. So it's the modern day equivalent of getting the National Geographic magazine. So um, anyway, you just create the user there. You can have it with or without a password. And let's see. Oh, and there's additional parental controls right here. And, things for the app store. Oh, I do want to point out one thing. Uh, you can do dictation. So, does, has it, does, do any of you use Siri on your iPhone? Oh, it's the bomb. But rather than that, let's go in and let's take a little note here. And I'm going to double tap my function button. If you double tap the function button, comma, you can talk and it will quote type, close quote for you, period. New paragraph. Don't forget, comma, you must speak your punctuation, period. I find myself now, comma, since I dictate so much, comma, when I leave someone a voicemail, I'm putting in the punctuations on their voicemail and it's crazy, period. built into your Mac. The function button is on everyone's keyboard. You double tap it to start speaking and, want, and you wait for it to beep. And then when you're done speaking or when you're done with that little missive, you single tap it. It records up to 30 seconds and then it will stop and put up what you've recorded or what you've typed. And then you can start over and pick up you could continue going on for as long as you want, period. New paragraph. The only problem is it's hard to differentiate between two, two, and numeral two, period. Let's see, two, 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 or two and two, you know, it's just, it's, it's tough. So uh, those few things it won't do right, but it does a great job and it's getting better. This isn't Siri, this is speech to, speech to text dictation. Anywhere you can type, whether it's in an email or anywhere else, you can do this. Now, on your iPhones, it's the equivalent, and this is important. Uh, let me see if I can get reflector up here really quick. The same thing you can do on your iPhone, it's, more, it's not just Siri. So I now have my iPhone coming up on the computer screen, all right? So now, everywhere I have a keyboard, for instance, you'll notice there's a mic, oh, we're a bit delayed here on the screen, come on, come on. Whoa, there it is. You have a microphone. If your phone is, if you have a 4S or newer, your phone is capable of Siri, you're also capable of dictation. So you simply tap the button, you tap the button once, comma, speak for up to 30 seconds, comma, and it will type what you say, period. So 
all your iOS devices, and if you have an iPad 3 or newer or iPad minis, it will also do that. That's a good way to get in so you can just punch the thing out really quick. Siri's a whole different story, and we do complete classes on Siri. So let me get that out of there. All right. Mail is, we've done Safari, so mail is probably the next most important. Apple Mail is really cool. Um, mail's kind of, Email's kind of boring. Well, Apple makes it so not so boring. First off, you notice across the top here, Apple has a tendency to be very minimalist. So what they did is they took these colorful icons at the top. Our eye picks out colors and shapes really well. So Apple made them all gray in the same shape. Go figure. But I'm going to show you how to change it to make it a little easier. If I click... If I control click or right click, you guys right click, anybody used to right clicking on a PC? So right clicking on your laptop is two finger click. If I two finger click, I can change it to icon and text. See how that is? It looks like icons only. I'm gonna two finger click icon and text. Two finger click is the same as right clicking on the, um, on the trackpad. Now, with those icons there, you can see things a little bit better. New message is to compose a new message. So I'm going to click new message. And you'll notice, I want to point out, iPhoto's right here. It doesn't have a little white tick by it. It's not running. So, oh, first off, I have to show you. Does anybody know what BCC is? BCC, blind carbon copy or blind courtesy copy. When you email something to a lot of people, it's good etiquette to put it in BCC so everybody doesn't see everybody else's names. That's just, you know, you've all gotten those mail with 35 different names on them. To activate BCC, you click over in this little area and click BCC. It will be on for the rest of the time. You don't have to do it every time. Now, when you send a mail to 12 people on BCC, everybody seems to think you have to put something in the to area. You don't. Two CC and BCC are exactly the same. So if we send this to Johnny Appleseed, I could also send it to CC to somebody else. They both see each other's email's address. But if we put something in BCC, nobody sees anybody else's email address, and that's a real clean way to do it. On the other hand, if you're doing, let's say, a potluck, they send it out to 12 people. You want to reply to everybody that you're bringing the salad so that nobody else brings salad. So you jump on really quick and say, I'm bringing the salad. And somebody else will have to bring the dessert and stuff. So you wouldn't BC something like a potluck dinner, okay? Where they're going to want to respond to everybody. Anyway, we talk, so we just start typing. And somebody that's in your... Uh, in your address book will automatically fill. Also, if someone you have already sent mail to or reply or gotten mail from, it will autofill in there. So don't keep typing. Let it autofill an address if you want. Uh, you can put a subject in here, test. But let's look. Oh, see my icons. I've got to double click my icons, two finger click, and there we go again. I've got these suspicious little buttons up here called show stationary and photo browser. Well, let's look at this. My iPhoto is not open. All of a sudden, I'm looking in my iPhoto library and I can simply drag those pictures right over to my mail from there. How cool is that? So I can shut that and I can make albums. I can go inside my iPhoto just like they were albums. But I have this other thing called show stationary. Not everyone will be able to see the stationery that you're sending, but most people will. Most email clients are pretty good these days. So I'm going to just click on photos and look at these choices of stationery I have. We'll pick this one right here. And those aren't my photos. And this isn't my text. So I just click on it. It's just a template. It's there. So if I go up to photo browser and I drop in the summer photo there and the horse photo over here, and this one, okay. 
But realistically, I want to swap these. So I just drag the photo over there and it switches them. No, oh, I really want this one in the middle. So you've made some cool stationery. It's another way to send somebody some photos. And the photo is still attached. So they're still going to get an attachment with the photo in it. And even if their email can't see all the pretty parts of the stationery, whatever you type and the photos themselves, they'll get. But have fun with it. You can be really creative. There's currently not a way to make new stationery in that regard. Okay, go ahead. Great, great question. So like Safari goes to any website, Chrome goes to any website. Apple Mail is just a program that can go get mail from anybody. Who's your email? Like I have several. So like you can do a Yahoo. You could have multiple ones. I have like six on mine. So what you do is when I go back here, when we click show, you could they'll and the way it works is you could have multiple emails in the inbox and you can click on each one of those accounts if you just want to see your Yahoo or just want to see your Gmail or if you click on inbox it shows them all like on your iPhones do you have multiple ones on your iPhone this is very similar and you can click on all inboxes or you can click on each specific one yeah and then the way it works is when you reply if it was sent to your Yahoo it's automatically going to reply from your Yahoo but watch you can change that uh, I don't know if it will here. Yeah, so you could change it. All your accounts that are outgoing are listed here. So if somebody sends it to your Yahoo, but you want to reply from your Gmail, you can select it there. You can on the phone too, but it's a little bit cumbersome. So there's a default one that it gets sent from on your phone. On here, it's whichever box you were currently clicked on. But yeah, you could have 20 of them. Click each one individually or click on inbox and it shows you the compendium of them all. Great question. It's, it's just a program that checks mail. Apple gives you free email with their iCloud, that's fine. I think the best email out there is Gmail, personally, because they have the best spam filter. And it works great in here. The other really th good thing about Gmail versus like, well, who, who here is on SureWest for their email? Comcast? OK. Uh, any other ISP? Who, who else is using email that's from their internet service provider? Anybody else? You guys are all on separate ones, like a Gmail or something like that. So you have Gmail too? Start using your Gmail more, because one thing that's cool about Gmail is if you check your mail, and, and some of the higher end Yahoo's do this and some of the others, if you check a mail on your computer and you reply, it'll show that you replied on your iPhone, et cetera, because now we have multiple devices. And they don't sync together, they sync with the server. And so if you reply, you want the other device to show you replied. It doesn't always work if you delete it. And on your iOS device, don't worry about deleting them. Because a new one, an older one will just come in behind it. They'll just roll off the bottom. Don't sweat it because they don't take up room on your iOS device. Uh, other than that, that's you know pretty much it for mail. Just uh, you know, you can do folders and things like that. I have a tendency not to use folders because you have a really powerful search tool up here where you can go in and just put in the person's name or whatever, and it'll search for all of the mail from them. Okay? All right, so that's Apple Mail. Uh, are you guys using Apple Mail, or are you going into the browser to check your, your mail accounts? Are you using Safari or a browser? Browser? On PC, was anybody using Outlook? You had Outlook. So this is like Outlook, but it's a little different. But I mean, it's really what happens. Outlook is your calendar, your address book, and your email all in one. Apple has it as three different programs, which is really kind of better, to be honest. A little, little tough getting used to. Speaking of contacts, you know, the time you spend keeping your address book up to date is going to manifest itself over time. And the cool thing is, if you change it here, it'll change it on your iPhone. If you change it on your iPhone, it'll change it here. So uh, you can make groups. Like let's say you had a potluck dinner you did once a month. You could have that potluck group as a group. You can't make a group on your iPhone or your iPad. But if you make a group on your Mac, it shows up on your iPhone and your iPad. Okay. Now, we think in the fall when we have iOS 8, we'll probably be able to make groups on the iPhone or the iPad. 
Any questions on address book? You guys just plunder through on that one. And the most important thing is, is where it says first name and it says last name. Try to keep everything where they're supposed to go because it makes searching and everything else a lot better, a lot easier. Calendar is really easy. Anybody using a calendaring program? Okay. Best thing, the easiest thing to do is if I'm going to take and put in, well, first of all, the easiest thing to do is use Siri. You, I just say, schedule test for 3 p.m. today. Okay, I can create your meeting. Note that you already have an all-day event of autumn power map for today. Shall I schedule it anyway? No, cancel. All right, Ken. I'll leave it off your calendar. So if I make it on my phone, it's going to propagate over to here. But to make an appointment in here, this is an Apple calendar here, and they've made it way too full. Up, oh, is it 920? Ah, our automation in this room stayed off. But I have to go get the TV. Didn't turn it off in that room. Sorry, one sec here. If anybody needs a break, this would be a quick time. It'll only take me a minute. I'm excited because inevitably at 920, this screen went up, this pressure went off, and it takes like four minutes for everything to come back on. So if I want to put in a, geez, I'll put it early in the morning here on this date, July. So I'll double click here, and I put uh, dentist 6 a.m. I don't know how you spell dentist, right? So I just put dentist 6 a.m. I don't have to fill out anything else, and boom, look at this. It does, it knows that I meant 6 a.m., 6 p.m., 6.30, et cetera. So it's kind of the way you would speak it. You don't have to go in and use all of this spin down, okay, this time, and all that stuff. You just type it like you mean it. Or, like I say, use Siri. We think in the fall there's a possibility Siri will go in here. Uh, that was calendar. Notes. Notes is really cool because if I have a note here and I want to make a note, it goes over to my iPhone and they sync back and forth. Uh, you can do shopping lists this way. Uh, my phone is not synced to this demo account, so I can't really show that. But basically, I would say add toothpaste to my Costco note and it'll put toothpaste on my Costco note. And I could add it here, and then it shows up here. And then when I get to Costco, as I go down each item, I would just delete them. And then when I get back, it's reset on the machine too. So notes are really good. Um, maps, Apple Maps, this is, this is, Apple Maps is really good. It does what Google Maps does. It shows traffic. It does all of that other stuff. But the best part about it is, let's go into regular standard mode goes quickly quickly and I'm just gonna say see if there's a bookmark the Transamerica pyramid let's say okay now if I do directions on here I can send it directly to my iPhone or my iPad that are linked on my account so in other words you're searching for your directions here boom you ping it right to your phone obviously you can share it by email to other people and things like that but the easiest way is if your iOS device is logged in to your iCloud this way. It's right there, it shows up, it opens up in Maps and you're ready to go. Uh, one cool thing about this, go ahead, ask your question. Uh, AirDrop, what is AirDrop? Uh, it's a way, to, right now, it's to send files from one Mac to the other. In the fall, you'll be able to send a file or that, like that link across to this device wirelessly comes across. It's just 
it's just another way of transferring a file without having to use an email or anything else. But what's cool about AirDrop is if, and it, right now it only works Mac to Mac and iPhone, iPad to itself, but it will allow me, like when, I, when I'm teaching our class this afternoon over at Empower Mac, everybody that's on the same, well actually not even the same network, we could be on different networks, but we're in close proximity. If it's in my address book, I can just push a file right to them. It'll show up on my screen that they're available to send a file to, and they have to, of course, accept it. It's not like you can just send it to them without that. So that's what AirDrop is. Good question on that. So Apple has pretty good 3D mapping here. And you'll notice it's even better. Hopefully the internet connection is good enough. So here is... So it's really, really strong. Um, again, uh, it, nothing wrong with Google Maps. It's really good. The, the advantage to Apple Maps is the fact that it'll interact with your device really easy. Okay, 3D is off, and we'll go out of Maps. Play with Maps. They're fun. Everybody tries to zoom into their house. You know, most of those satellite images are about 18 months old or so, so it really... They're not super current, and part of that's a pri bit of a privacy issue too. So, and that, that's really funny because you know the Google cars go around and they're taking all these street street shots of everything, and there's people that are out trying to punk them now, and they got like they got two guys doing they're in medieval garb and they're doing like a sword fight because they knew the car. They saw the car go up the other block, and they I don't know how they knew, but they got everything out and they're doing a fight. And then another person looks like they've killed a dead body, and there's some pretty fun Google car things like that. All right, so iPhoto. The question came up earlier, how do I get photos into iPhoto? If you have an iPhone, it is simply just like a good old digital camera. You can plug the cable into it, but if you're signed up on iCloud on the same of both of these, uh, and you turn on photo stream, any photo you take here will automatically go up to your iPhoto in the computer. Now iPhoto, the way to look at it is, You've got some categories on the left and they can really confuse you if you start looking at events and everything else. But when we take it in, in its simplest form, iPhoto is this shoebox that you're putting all your photos into. And those photos can be sorted any way you want, but they're pretty much sorted chronologically if you leave it alone. And then when I grab the scroll bar over here and I scroll up and down, I can go through in there. Oop, let me make sure they're in chronological order. They weren't. So if I sort by date, now when I scroll, the date shows up that I'm at. By default, they put the newest at the bottom. You can switch that around if you want. That's easy to do. But it's simply a shoebox of your photos. Above it is another way of looking at your shoebox by event. So an event could be a cruise. When you import your photos into it, it will automatically create a new event every 24 hours. So in other words, if you're on a cruise and it's a five-day cruise, you probably don't want five different events. So you would merge those events. That's easy to do. Or if you have a breakfast and you're taking photos there and then that evening you have a graduation party, those are two separate events. You would split those events. But events are simply another way of looking at those photos in the shoebox. Don't get really hung up on events. If your photos were brought in from a PC, in the PC there were, they were in folders. Every folder became an album here. You could have had a folder that said 2008, 2009. They came into events. But faces, facial recognition is pretty cool. Uh, places, we won't really play with that much, but you can, spend, you can waste hours and hours and hours doing the facial recognition. If you pick it a few times, it will find other people's, other faces, the same face in other photos throughout your whole thing. And the more you choose of that person, the better it'll get. But only do that for people you're ever going to search for, because there's people in your photos that you're going to do facial recognition where you don't really care if you're ever going to have to search for them. If we go down to photos, and let's say I select these 
six photos, nine, six photos. I want to make an album out of these photos because I'm going to want to make a slideshow. Actually, let's, let's pick more than those. Oh, by the way, there's a little slider down here to make your thumbnails bigger or smaller. I'm going to take, I want to get a few that have portrait photos. There we go. So I'm just clicking in the gray and dragging. I'm selecting these photos. Um, I have 30 photos selected. First off, I'm going to add to, and I can create a new album. And I'm just going to call that album test. It's pretty creative, I know. Now, all those pictures are in my test album, but they're still in my photos album. I have not duplicated the photos. These are simply pointers to the photos in my shoebox. So a photo could be in 20 different albums, and it's not like you're having to do extra photos, OK? Let's say I don't want this photo in my album. I simply click it and delete it. It has not deleted it from my shoebox. It's just deleted it from the album. And if I go back up to photos, and I take a bunch of new photos, Remember that, that ball? So I know, I'm, I know I'm definitely doing some that I'm duplicating here. If I drag these to my test album, I've added it to my test album. That soccer ball's back. But you'll notice I still only have 30 photos. It won't duplicate the photo if it's already there. Okay. So if you're not sure if it's in the album, drag it to the album. Once it's in an album, you can do a lot of things. I can say, like, for instance, when I go to a national park, I want to make sure I get the entrance sign. But a lot of times I forget and get it on the way out. So I, let's say this soccer ball one is the one I want to start my album with. I put it up. I can move it. Now that it's in an album, I can put it right at the beginning. And that's going to be my first one. I can change the order however I want manually once I've made the album. Now. I know a lot of you brought pieces of paper, so if you probably got about 12 pages left on your paper, I'm going to show you how hard it is to make a slideshow. If we go to share, actually we can go to add to either one. They both take us to slideshow. Oop, I only have one photo selected. Let me select the group. So I go down here, add to slideshow. I'm going to create a new slideshow. And all my photos are across the top here. But let's say I want to change the order of the photos. I can now just drag this one to make it be the second photo, for instance. Okay? I can do whatever I want. But what's a, what's a slideshow without some music? Well, first off, actually, I want to do a theme. So here in the lower right-hand corner are themes. And when you hover over it, it shows you what the theme does. You watch on there, it just barely, as I hover over it with my cursor, it shows me what that theme does. Ken Burns is the one where it slowly pans on the photos, like he made the baseball and the Civil War one. That's called the Ken Burns effect. I'm going to show you vintage prints because I really like how it comes out. We're going to use it. And what's a slideshow without music? Well, I have some pre-programmed music in here that comes with themes. And you can use these to post to YouTube. You have to be careful if you use commercial music and post to YouTube. When you burn a DVD for somebody else, that's fine. But what happens is your music may get stripped out of your slideshow if you post it to YouTube if you use commercial music. It depends on the artist. These songs that are built in are fine. But I can reach in to my entire iTunes library and pick any song out of my iTunes or any number of songs out of iTunes to put into my slideshow. So right now, I'm just going to choose endless. Well, actually, I'm going to click back out of that because it has a built-in one for the theme. So we're going to select music. And the last setting is, might be hard to see from back there. You normally want the slideshow to show from four to six seconds, or each slide, excuse me. But let's say you have. I do a lot of these for memorials, and they want certain songs in there. So you take the length of the songs, figure out how many slideshows you have, figure out how much music you're going to have, 
and figure out, you know, five seconds each or so. But inevitably, the slideshow ends and the song still plays, or the song ends and the slideshow still plays. There's a setting right here where you can say fit slideshow to music. So as long as you've done a pretty good calculation, so one slide isn't up there for 20 seconds at a time, or for a second at a time, you can make the two fit together perfectly and it does it automatically. We're just going to leave it at the default setting here. And I have not touched anything except made a theme at this point, right? That's how hard it is to make a slideshow. You'll notice the photos in the background that are in black and white are other photos in your slideshow. And it's, there's no heavy lifting. How hard was that? Kind of slow music. Yeah, I kicked the ball from here to there, see? Yeah. So obviously these slides aren't, they aren't kind of relevant to one another. But see, there's a portrait slide. Fits in really well. Doesn't crop it real bad. So how tough is it to make a slideshow? And how fun and how creative can that be? You can change different themes. You can change the music. And then there's even a way you can export it and put it on YouTube or do different things like that where just save it as a file and put it on Dropbox. So uh, have fun with iPhoto. Make albums. You can't, you're not going to screw anything up. Let's show you really quickly what we can do to photos, though. I'm going to eliminate that slideshow. So I just delete the slideshow. So let's go in. And here's a good photo. So I'm going to double click on this photo. Even though I'm in the album, I'm double clicking on this photo. Notice how the grass is kind of dark in this area right here. This is a good photo, but let's see what we can do to correct it or mess it up. I'm going to click edit in the lower right. And I can just click a thing called enhance. And you can kind of tell it lightened a little. It doesn't really show on the screen very much because obviously this is an Apple photo, so it's pretty good to begin with. But let's just say we want to crop it. We're going to crop it down a little bit. And I want to get that grassy area in there, so I hit done. I've cropped it. I can go in here. Let's hit retouch. This would be for blemishes or things. Let's see if I can retouch this right here. Don't know how well it's going to work, but we'll try. This is like for blemish removal and things like that, but see, it took, took care of most of that where the writing was. Obviously, it's not perfect. The idea is not for that. It would be for like when you, when you scan a photo that may have a crease or a line in it, or you may have someone with a blemish on their face. This retouch will pop that right off. But let's look at this grassy area right here, the grassy knoll, of course, for those of us old enough to know what that means. Uh, if we go up here into Edit and Adjust, I'm going to bring light out of those shadows and look what happens to the grass back there. See how much brighter it is? You can actually see the definition of the grass. Here's the photo originally. Oops. My fault. So let's say I go through here. Remember I did that adult thing and all that. I really gobbed up the photo. No matter what I do, I can always revert to original. And my original photo is untouched. And so don't feel that you're going to do anything wrong if you can't reverse. No matter what happens, your original photo is always preserved. Okay? Any questions on iPhoto? Have fun with it. You can't hurt. The biggest thing is you plug either a camera in, plug your iPhone in, import the pictures, catalog them. You can make, you can put keywords in, you can do a lot of that different stuff, but get them in there and then you can do lots of things with them like have them show up in an email, make a slideshow, things like that. Go ahead. When you're selecting the photos of an album, on a PC you can use the control button to like skip from and pick more up. 
Yeah, and that'll be on the keyboard shortcuts page, but it's very good. And it applies whether it's photos or files or anything. So what I can do is I click on one item, and if I hold the command key, the clover leaf, I can then select different items. Oh, I didn't mean to click that while still holding the command. Every time I click it, it toggles back and forth. Another cool shortcut is if I click on the first item and hold the shift key, it will select the contiguous items between them. But if I don't want the horse, I hold the command key and deselect it. So that's a good point. Yes, command. Uh, the command key is kind of close to what the control key on the PC it would be. Like for cut, copy, and paste was control C, control V, control P, or no, control X, C, and V. It's command here. And the way you can always tell that too is if you go up here, your little cheat sheets are up here. Not for selecting the photos. Another one you can do to select all is command A for select all. Those are on that cheat sheet. So print that cheat sheet out at kenspencer.com. And that applies, like I say, to photos, whether it's iTunes, etc. Um, so any other questions on iPhoto? I'm going to touch on iTunes really quick. iTunes is just like iPhoto is the shoebox for your photos, iTunes is the shoebox for your music, and so much more, really. Um, there's another way to view your iPhoto or iTunes, and I'm going to show you how to do that is if you go up to view, you can say show sidebar. And this, if you're used to the older iTunes, is the way it used to be. And I find this a little more functional. So it was view. Everything is, we're affecting the view. Let me turn the TV off in there. Okay. Now, we have an Apple TV in here connected. Does anybody have an Apple TV? So with an Apple TV, you don't, it's not like it's for broadcast TV. But what it allows you to do is to sh have your Mac show up on a projector or on a TV. It's a little box. It's 100 bucks. Oh, hey, I have one. It's 100 bucks. And it plugs into your TV and goes to your wireless network. The other cool thing about this, your iTunes library can show up on here. Uh, your Netflix, this is the best way to watch Netflix that there is. You still have to have a Netflix account, but you enter it in here. And if you do get an Apple TV, there's a little remote control that comes with it. But the cool thing is, is with your iPhone, you have a remote control app. So like for Netflix, where you're trying to search for a, a, a title of something, the keyboard on the iPhone is where you type instead of moving the cursor up and down and all around. But I, Apple TV is pretty good. But they're not broadcast TV. They're really not. Anyway, iTunes, it's the same thing as with iPhoto. You make, in this case, you make albums instead of, or sorry, you make playlists instead of albums, okay? Uh, they're on the side. And again, a song can reside in as many playlists as you'd like. And you can also burn your playlist to a CD right from here. Uh, you probably didn't get a CD player with your Mac. They do sell you one, the $79 one that's with Apple, just plugs into USB. But there's some aftermarket ones for $50 or so too. The Apple one's the cleanest. It's just Apple has gotten away, and most of the computer companies now are getting away from putting CD drives in there because that's the first thing that fails. So if it fails, it's better to have as, as an external. And Apple doesn't build those. They're made by a couple of companies in the world. So, Any questions on iTunes? Uh, does anybody here listen to podcasts at all? I love podcasts. And when I listen to a podcast like on my iPhone, I can play it at one and a half times its normal speed, and it's pretty good. And it really is nice because you can pound through it pretty quick. The video ones, not so much because that's a little bit of fractured, fractured flickers. Uh, let's see if there's any here. Yeah, so podcast, whatever, like here, Alan Turing Code Breaker. I mean, that's a total geeky thing right there. But there's so much stuff out there. And there's also iTunes U. iTunes U is free courses. Uh, maybe you won't let me with this. Yeah, Stanford, MIT. Most of these colleges have a lot of their professors' courses recorded, and it's all free. 
There's tons of things out there. TED, of course, and then uh, what's the other one? Can Khan Academy is another place to get a lot of online content. The beauty of this is everything will sync between your devices. Movies, if you buy a movie from Apple, you can have it on all your devices. If you rent a movie, it'll be on all your devices, but the studios clamped down and they said, okay, for rentals, if you rent the movie, you've got to start watching it within 30 days. And if you start watching it, you have to complete it in 24 hours. So don't start watching it when you're really tired one night unless you can get back and watch it the next day. And that's a stupid regulation. Apple hates it, but it's the way the movie studios in their backward technology way did it. All right. Uh, let's go through just questions now. We talked about Flash. I want to go through and hit anything that you guys are, need to know about more and more. This is just a quick overview, but just dig in. You can't get hurt by it, and you have some good help capabilities in it. So go ahead. Do you have to uh, download to new documents? Do you have to have a special program that you buy? You've got you two built in. Okay. okay. Sure. The first is a really simple one that they don't really talk about very much. Oh, well, that's, I should get to this point. Up in the upper right-hand corner is what's called Spotlight. It's this little magnifying glass that has huge implications. When I click on this, I'm going to use this to find text edit, the program. Text edit, oh, there it is. I hit return. This is a very simple, rudimentary, super, super simple word processing document. Okay? You can see it looks like the old, just very simple. That's built in. If you just want to pound out a quick note or something like that, go ahead and use this. But over here is Pages. Pages, again, the Apple wants to embrace you and help you be creative. So if you go to Pages, it doesn't look like Word, although it will do the same thing as Word does. But it's got a bunch of these templates built in. If I go New, here's all these templates. Here's stationary. So this is kind of linear, right? This would be typewritten. If we go down to a newsletter, this is more graphic based. It does both of those very well. So if I want to get, you basically go by the templates, and if I want to do a simple letter, I would fire up one of these existing ones, like this, and just start typing away, okay? Obviously when you fill in what you said, and of course, I can dictate comma so I really don't have to type, period. But in a long letter, comma, you may have to do a lot of corrections, period. Okay? Double click the function button. So watch, watch what will happen on the screen. I double click it to give my bing, and then I can start speaking to it. And as I speak, you'll notice my volume is shown in the microphone. If I talk really quietly, it will still work, comma. And if I talk loud, it'll really work, period. No, no, period gives me period. I'm sorry. Tap the function key once more or tap the done on the microphone. But if I go too long after 30 seconds, it'll time out and it'll type what you've written and then you can start from there. I think it's, I'm starting to shorten it up a little bit because if it fails, it's failed for everything you just said. So kind of when you would have a natural pause, it's pretty easy to just click function. It'll, it'll stop and type and then you can start right up again. And that's anywhere you can type. That's not just pages. So if I go back to this template chooser, new and newsletter, and if we grab like this newsletter right here, the cool thing about this newsletter is I can insert a whole nother page into the next. I can add pages to this, and they're all going to look the same. And I simply go here, and we'll call it Best by Class. Yeah. Too long for that. Too big a font. Best by. But this isn't my photo. So I simply go up here and click on media this time. And my media is what I'm going for. And I'm going to drop in this photo right there. And I can click media back. I can replace these photos up here with something from my media. 
move this out of the way. <coughs> Excuse me. You can search in there if you had named uh, your photos like polar bear or something like that, it would search for that. Let's see, this one has vacation. Everywhere you see a magnifying glass, you can search. Okay. If you had made albums, like here's my albums in iPhoto. So if you were going to make a newsletter, you'd probably put certain photos in your album. So you don't have to weed through your whole library of thousands of photos. You just go into that album. That's pages. You can do a lot or a little here. It's really cool if we go down here. Let's see if this will work. No. Replace the sample text to make this work, period. It doesn't allow you to highlight their existing text, comma, because it really wants you to get rid of it, period. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this in a couple times here. Okay. Let's say I want to do something with this text right here. You have great capabilities. I can take and change the fonts of just that. Change the color of that font. It's always best to pick the little crayons, make it blue. You can really gob this thing up if you like, make it bold text. The other cool thing is, uh, oh, where's character spacing? This would be before the paragraph. See how it spaces it out a little bit different? Different line spacing. And it's all right on the fly. Now, I've made this document. I've made it really ugly, but I've made this document. I want to share it with someone. So if I go up to share, I'm going to send a copy by email, by messages, or airdrop. I'm going to email it. So watch how easy this is. I'm going to send a copy. Oh, how do I want to send it? As pages? Well, believe it or not, pages now comes free even on a PC in a browser. They can do pages in a browser. But most people have Word or PDF. PDF stands for Portable Document Format. If you send it a PDF, they're going to see it exactly how you see it. If you send it as Word, if they don't have the font you're using, it won't show up right and it'll look kind of ugly. But if you send it as a PDF, and watch this. I'm going to hit next. And my email was not open. And without my hands leaving my wrist, a brand new email, email message fires up. And there it goes. How hard is that? And you would simply type their, app, their address up here in the top. Johnny Appleseed. He gets a lot of emails from me. He's a fake guy that Apple uses. And you'd simply hit send. So with pages. It allows you to be creative. You can, total, you can start with a total blank slate, or you can adapt one of the templates. I really encourage you to, use, to, to play with pages. It's really, really, really fun. And if you go up to help, you'll notice here there's what's new in pages. It'll take you to this and kind of walk you through a bit of the tutorial. So, and again, you can export it as a Word, as a Word document. And the other thing is, if a lot of you are using Gmail, you know, Google Docs, that works on here just fine, too, and that does Word documents. Okay, any other, you guys, you haven't got any less questions, questions? Come on, you guys are asking each other a question. What's that? I, I didn't hear, I'm sorry. Oh, the baby. Oh, the baby. Was that? And see, I think that was one of the stationaries. Yeah, that was one of the stationaries. It's great show, great photos. Apple has a tendency to make their media pretty good. This is, like I say, in this user, it's it's particular Apple stuff because it really does a good job of showing that. Um, let's see what else we can do. Um, so you guys are all laptops. So if you, you know, you go to McDonald's, you go to a hotel, they've got Wi-Fi. This is where you connect with the different Wi-Fi's right up here, this little airport logo right here. And anything without a lock you can connect to. These are just printers, so you wouldn't want to connect to them. But anytime you see it, it may prompt you for a password. 
that's that. This shows your battery state, what you've got left on your battery. This is your sound. This is time machine. And this is important. Does anyone here back up the computer current? Has anyone here ever, ever lost data? I'm sorry? Click free. Click free is? External hard drive, and it's not for Apple, I'm sure. okay. So we talked about putting photos in here, and you're going to have documents. A lot of that stuff's on the cloud now. We'll talk about cloud in a minute. But for anything that's stored on your computer, uh, you know these photos get really important because those those are music. You can always get your music again. The photo of Mozambique or the photo that she was five years earlier, you're never going to get those little baby pictures like you saw. I mean, those are just priceless for the people to have them. That's why when the fire rushes up Malibu Canyon, the people that are at home, you see them grabbing their, their photo books and they're running out with them. Well, the people that weren't home when the fire rushed up Malibu Canyon, those photos are lost. On your computer, there's one other parameter. Besides a laptop could get stolen, uh, it could crash. Apple doesn't make the hard drives. They buy the best hard drives they can, but if that hard drives can crash, you want to be protected against catastrophic drive failure. So Apple has something built in called Time Machine. Time Machine is a program. And it makes it really easy if you buy a hard drive, any hard drive, doesn't have to say Mac on it. They used to always charge more if the hard drive said Mac on it. They don't anymore. But don't feel like you have to buy one that says Mac on it. Because as soon as I plug this in, within about 45 seconds, a little window would pop up and say, well, I see that you've plugged in an external hard drive. Would you like to use Time Machine? And you say yes. And it says, well, to use Time Machine, I'm going to have to erase that hard drive you just plugged in. So in your case, if you have an existing hard drive, you may not want that data erased, so don't do it. But hard drives are cheap. You can get one of these for 69 bucks. Um, plug it in. It'll say, I want to erase that hard drive. You say, OK, it'll erase. And then whenever it's plugged in, it will back up every hour. Now, it's not called backup. It's called time machine. Because let's say I, I give the example, if you're out in the yard, taking pictures of your roses, and the neighbor's cat rushes by. And you don't like that cat, but you grab a photo of it. It's really blurry because the cat was moving. So you get in, and you upload all your photos, and you weed through the roses' pictures, and you save the ones you like. But that cat picture, you save it. But three months later, you go, God, I'm going to clean out my library. I don't like that cat anyway. It was a blurry picture. OK, I'm going to delete it. But three months after that, your neighbor comes over and says, my cat's gone. Do you still have that photo so I can make a lost cat poster? Well, it's not in your iPhoto. And at this point, you have a moral dilemma because you don't like the cat. But you can say, well, I don't have it. Or you can reach back into Time Machine and recover something you've deleted already. Back to when you first did it. So Time Machine is built in. It's easy. Don't use the programs that come with these. You just plug it in and use it. I encourage everyone to have a backup, especially with a laptop. Laptops, hard drives are more prone to failure because we're portable. That's really, it's not the hard drives are any worse. If it gets stolen in your car, if it gets run over, you leave it on the roof of the car, things like that happen. Most of the time, the hard drive's recoverable if you have the machine. But what it makes it also makes it very easy is if you ever get a new Mac, or let's say this one gets stolen or something happens, you simply plug the time machine into the new Mac and you press restore back to where I was, and it will bring in all your passwords, all your bookmarks, all your photos, everything exactly where you left off. And if you have two users on the computer, it does both of them. If you have two Macs, it does both of those. Now, it doesn't back up your iPhone and your iPad, but you get free iCloud backup with those. In the future, the cloud is going to back it up also. But realistically, a physical hard drive is the best. So this is one you plug in. The other thing Apple offers is a thing called a time capsule. It's a, wire, it's a Wi Fi router for you, and it has a hard drive built in. So instead of having to plug it in, anytime your computer is at your house and connected to your Wi Fi, it will back up your data to this. The program's time machine 
This is called time capsule. These are $299. They're $199 without the hard drive or they're $299 with the hard drive. So as a laptop, it's a choice you can make. But you don't have to have the Apple solution. Anything will work. It's just this wireless one's a pretty simple solution. Um, I, I can't stress backups enough. And what I do, I get that call from my clients all the time. My hard drive crashed. My computer got stolen. My house burnt down. And the first question I ask, and believe me, because I take people's data very seriously, the first question I ask is, do you have a time machine backup? And when they say yes, it's a sigh of relief. And believe it or not, I can walk them through it on the phone. It's that easy. Go ahead. Um, instead of restoring your data, if you just wanted to like, go through and like, grab a document, can you just plug it back in, you can pull a document back on your computer? Yeah, and it's really strange, uh, but which you, there is a way to go in and do that. But what I'll encourage anybody to do is, if you do need to go get that document or whatever, or if you need to do a time machine backup or restore, call me first. I'll walk you through it on the phone. It just takes a few minutes. But yes, you actually can go in, and your same file structure will be there. For instance. A finder window like this, let's say documents, I could say, go show me what this like looked like last November. And if the document shows up there, I can just restore just that document, or in fact, I could restore the whole folder from that date, like in contacts, things like that. Yeah, it's, it's simple but amazing. But I don't encourage people to go in and ranch with it just when you need it. Go ahead. And then also you were saying that when you plug it back in, it has to delete what was on. If you were telling her she had that on when she had Because she has a, it backs up her PC. Right. And what's going to happen is, if you plug it back in, it's going to delete what's on there. So it's going to delete the document that you have on there. So when it formats it, the drive has to be formatted for Time Machine. Anytime you format a drive, it wipes everything off the drive. So that's why I said if she needs that data on there, don't do that if you need to control it for that. So realistically, it, whatever's on a drive will get wiped out. Only the first time you use it as time machine. After that, and then the cool thing is when it gets full, it works like a DVR, and it'll start deleting your oldest stuff you've already deleted. So that cat picture, after two years, it may be gone, but the pictures of the roses that you saved, they don't get gone. Better at this. We haven't had our automated thing in here. I mean, it's really weird. The shades drop, the lights go off, these backlights come on, and it worked without it. Go ahead. Can I transfer the pictures on my clip free to my PC? Depends on how they're formatted in there. Does your PC still work? Oh, I mean the Apple, the MacBook. Yeah, but what you, your click free is your hard drive, you said? No, it's the external hard drive. Right, that was for your PC? Yes. And do you still have your PC? Yes. And does it work? Yes. We can for sure get them there, whether the click free, because what happens is, like she mentioned, can we go back and get the documents in Time Machine? Well, realistically, you couldn't do that from like another computer too easily because of permissions. But you're better off if either getting the drive out of your PC or going and getting the photos in your PC rather than from your backup. Because sometimes what they do with backups is they compress the data in there and then you have to expand it to do it all. You're better off, unless it's something you're trying to get that had been deleted, that's a whole different story. No, you're better off going in, and what you can actually do is on your PC, well, first of all, on your Mac, there's a simple way to migrate your data from your PC. If you haven't done that yet, you're able to do it from what's called Migration Assistant. And you just watch your right here, you have to download a little program on your PC, and you say migrate, and it'll bring all your photos and all your music in. Not your programs, because PC programs are different than Mac programs. But it would bring in your documents, your photos, and your music. And if you used, in the case of using Outlook, it'll bring in the Outlook stuff. But not other stuff. It, it, most people, you know, Outlook is not used by most people on the PC. But the other thing you can do is you can also put a thumb drive in your computer. Just drag your photos from your pictures folder on your PC onto the thumb drive. And bring the thumb drive over to here. A Mac can read PC files, but a PC can't read Mac files. That's kind of how it works. Good questions. Your shirt, your keep calm, and I saw the best one. It was a Down syndrome kid, and the T-shirt said, "Keep calm. It's only an extra chromosome." And I thought it was just the funny. What a great, what a great thing for a kid like that to have. All right, uh, I want to talk about iCloud real quickly, or cloud. 
people get intimidated when we talk about cloud computing and what the cloud is and what iCloud is. First of all, my iPhone and my computer don't sync with each other. They sync via the cloud. But don't get intimidated by the cloud because if you've ever checked email, you've used the cloud. Essentially, if I send something to a Gmail account, I send it up, it goes to a Gmail account that's, you know, let's say Johnny Appleseed's Gmail account up on a server somewhere. And then his iPhone goes and checks it, his Mac goes and checks it, his iPad goes and checks it, and even his PC can go and check it. The, the Gmail server. It's essentially on the cloud because it's transparent to us. It's actually a computer in a real large high-tech building somewhere, and it's a little space that's segregated for Johnny Appleseed's Gmail account. So that's how mail works. Essentially, it's like you have your mail sent to a post office, and you can either go on the web to gmail.com and look at the post office. It's like going to the post office. Or with a mail client, they bring a copy to your house, which is what gets downloaded to your computer or your iPhone or your iPad. That's a copy. Okay. Now, cloud computing, everybody says, well, I can't see the cloud. I don't know where my stuff is. But the idea is, is the perfect example is, if I put a new contact in on my iPhone, I want it to be able to show up here. And since these don't connect directly, they connect through Apple's supercomputer that's in Maiden, North Carolina, that's a billion dollar complex. And this goes to there. I have a little place in the iCloud that my data goes to. And then it goes down to here. If I make a change here, it goes to the iCloud and then down to here. So the whole beauty of that is, is that the interaction, there's a the gatekeeper, there's a center point where everything intersects, and then it goes, everything comes to it, and then from there it comes down to everything else. That's the same computer that Siri uses, by the way, as this big computer in North Carolina. But it works for your calendar appointments. It works for pages, numbers, and keynote. If you make a document in pages, numbers, and keynote, you can continue on your iPhone and your iPad and it's already there if you've decided to save it to the cloud. You can't see it, but it just shows up in pages. Oh, that's the one I want. And you could continue working on your pages document. Not so much on the iPhone, you could, but on an iPad or on another Mac. So that's the cloud. Don't be intimidated by it. You'll, you'll know if it's working if your stuff goes back and forth, but that's where it's important to have an iCloud account doesn't have to be or something else, but you have to have an Apple ID iCloud account, and they're the same between computers. Now, do you guys share an iTunes account? We did. She had just set up her own account. Okay. So she has all the songs on my main iTunes account. In the fall, I would wait till the fall, because in the fall, we never, always the iTunes accounts have been isolated. And I've always recommended people share an iTunes account because if you rent a movie, if you buy a song, if you buy a movie, you want to share it. Like apps on the iPhone or apps here, the same account can share all those apps. Like if you bought a, if you bought a $50 navigation app on the phone, you could share it amongst everybody on the same iTunes account, and the apps that you buy from the app store are the same. But we've never been able to combine iTunes accounts. There's a new thing coming out in the fall they're going to allow what's called family sharing. So in other words, that'll be a way for her to get her music off the old iTunes account onto a new iTunes account, etc. And the really cool thing for somebody younger than you, because you look like you're pretty responsible, but let's say you have a young child that's, got, that's doing games, and they come in and they say, well, I want to buy the upgrade to this. I want to buy three donuts with this, and it's 30 bucks. It can be set up so the parent can say, hey, Johnny Appleseed wants to buy this. Do you want to allow or not allow? And it comes on their phone that the other one's doing it on that account. And they can say, because, you know, it's a way to control the purse strings of the credit card. And iTunes gift cards are a good way to do it. But in a family, it's important to share your iTunes account as much as possible because you don't have to buy things a second time. But you can set it so you don't like her music and she doesn't like your music. So you can set it so it doesn't automatically, if she buys a new song, it doesn't automatically download to you. You turn the automatic downloads off. Um, but as far as iCloud and your data, you guys probably don't have, want the same contacts. You should have a different iCloud account than she has a different iCloud account. So the Apple ID works for a couple different things. iCloud is one thing which is all your data, your calendars and everything. 
of which you can share things across, but you don't want all her names and she doesn't want all your names. And the other problem is, if you delete one of her names by accident, it deletes it from hers too. And then it's like, oh my gosh, you know, that was the only contact of it. So that's where you can have separate iCloud accounts, Apple ID iCloud accounts, but you can have same or soon you can have different iTunes accounts. So do you guys share an iTunes account back there? Yeah, just you'd have separate ones? So you'll be able in the fall to merge. What I, in the past I've always told people, take whoever has the most invested in it and stay with that one, but now this family sharing thing is gonna work out real well. Because the other weird thing is, this has become very contentious in divorce issues. You know, somebody might have 20,000 songs they bought from iTunes and it's like, who gets this? And it's really kind of a, and I'm not saying, <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just saying it's when you think of, or when a kid goes away to college. How do you handle that? So this family sharing thing works really well. And we talk about apps for the iPhone, but remember we have the App Store on here. If you buy an app, so the apps on the App Store for the Mac, those apps might be the same name, like Numbers, Keynote, et cetera, but they are not the same as on the iPhone and the iPad. The operating systems are separate. So most of the things you buy, if it's a buy one, there'll be an app, uh, Mac version, and there'll be an iPad, iPhone version. And it's not to get more money out of you, it's just they're totally different programs. In the future, those may merge, but for the time being, the nice thing is, though, if you buy an app for your Mac, it's available on every Mac you have if you have multiple Macs. But again, remember, if you have two users, all applications are available to both users. You don't have to buy it a second time. Is this the printer that's compatible with the MacBook? Every printer out there is compatible with the MacBook. This happens to be the right height for my holding my, my thing here. But let me tell you about printers a second. Never look at the price of a printer. And you're talking to Ken, Mr. Cheap Guy. Look at the price of the ink. Because that's what's going to cost you over time. So HP, I've never been a big fan of HP. My, my business partner in Power Mac works for HP. But he's the guy that used to work for Apple. But HP used to be overpriced on their ink. HP has a new program that certain printers are doing, and by the fall, they're probably going to offer it on all their printers, where you pay so much per month for all the pages you want, and they send you ink whenever you need it, and it's less expensive. 50 pages a month is $2.99 a month for ink you want. If you think about that, that's pretty good, and your pages could roll over to the next month. They don't roll, keep rolling over, but the most you could roll over is your 50. Then they go up from there. So Bob or one of the HP people can tell you about that. I think that's a good one. If you print a lot, get a laser printer, black and white laser printer. Maybe have color if you want, but print all your stuff on black and white laser because your printing costs will be next to nothing. These days, you know, we're printing less and less because you can email it to somebody, you can message it to them, you know, you can share that document here and there. And with the cloud, you can upload it to the cloud. I forgot to mention, you can't email like 10 large photos because they're too big to email. In the fall, you're gonna have a really easy way to do it by simply sending people a link. You could send them 100 photos, but you're not sending the photos. You're just sending them a link to the iCloud drive and it comes right down to it. You can't send videos either. You'll be able to send videos that way. Like that slideshow you made, you'll be able to put it up in your iCloud drive you send it to there, and then from there, people just download it, just like they would a YouTube video. So it's really cool, and that's coming in the fall, and that's free. You get five gigabytes of free storage with that. So I hate to say in the fall on that. There's some other ways to do it now with Dropbox and everything else, but only if you need it between now and the fall do you want to mess with that stuff, because Apple will make it very simple for you. Okay, good question on the printer. Look at consumable pricing. Virtually every printer is compatible with the Mac, but the other thing is, is you also want to be able to print, newer printers will allow you direct to print from your iPad and your iPhone. So you want one that says Air Print. And that's great, that's wonderful to be able to do, print right from your iPad or your iPhone. You know, otherwise you gotta email it to here and do like that, but most every printer is iPrint now. If they're a wireless printer, and you want a wireless printer, that's pretty much what they all are. Good questions. We got done early, so let's, anything else anybody wants to cover they feel a little bit not too good about? No, I had a question about my photo stream. Okay. It's my understanding it only saves for 30 days. 
Okay. She's had it for six months. Oh, good, good question. So let's talk about PhotoStream. Um, PhotoStream is good for up to 1,000 photos in up to 30 days, but they've been keeping them up longer. But what that means is, now, your phone takes the photos, right? As long as you don't, as long as they're on this and you don't delete them from here, forget PhotoStream for a second. As long as they're on here, they're going to stay on here. Nothing will delete that from you. But when you take a photo, it goes up to the cloud. If you have PhotoStream on, it goes, and it doesn't count against your five gigabytes of free storage either. It just goes up there. So then, if I have my Mac signed into the same iCloud account, and I go to iPhoto and turn on photo sharing, every photo that goes up there will come down here as long as I've started my Mac in that 30-day period. Okay? Then it comes here. If you don't want to do that, you can still use the cable. But what's really cool is if you still decide to use the cable to hook it up here, it'll say, well, these are already in here and it won't bring in the duplicates. It would only bring only those in that haven't come in from PhotoStream. PhotoStream the other way around it is, if you have an iPad, you know, it'll show, so if it takes pictures, it lives on it, and it goes to the photo stream also. But they'll show up here, but they don't get downloaded to here unless you tell it to because you have limited space. Just like every photo I take here, in the 30 days it's on photo stream will show up on my iPad, but I have to physically download it to my iPad to make it store on my iPad. Where here, it automatically downloads it into iPhoto. If you're ever in doubt, plug the cable in and say import my photos. And it will only import the ones that haven't been imported yet. Okay? So PhotoStream's handy, and the whole idea is, is it's twofold. Apple has called this the post, or Steve Jobs in his last keynote said, it's really the post PC era. We're going away from really needing a PC to being able to use an iPad or an iPhone all the time, really more an iPad. But for most of the stuff we do, we still need, they call this a pickup truck. We still need a truck. You know, if you're going to move a refrigerator, it doesn't work in a little Toyota Corona, you know, or Corolla, you know, or a Camry. You've got to have a pickup truck to move a refrigerator. So we still need pickup trucks for a lot of typing and things like that. But again, anything it does here, as long as you have it on here, it will automatically come down. And then you don't have to manage it. It just... If you, you, when you shoot 1,001 photos up there, your oldest photo drops off this end and the new one comes in. It's just kind of a rotating thing. You don't have to manage it at all. And you can go in and delete things if something up there. You're the only one that can see it. So don't feel like you have to go up if you get a really weird photo up there. Nobody else can see it. It's all completely protected. And that's the other thing is Apple, Apple is very concerned about your security. They're standing very, very hard up against the, the NSA. They are the first company that's made a real thing to say, look, we will only share the data with you, or we will sh only share things that are required to us by warrants. Warrants and subpoenas. They will not share your data there. Yeah. Unlike some of the other companies, Google and Apple, and, and Go Google also is very good. They've been getting a bad rap, but Google is actually disclosing all the things they share, which nobody else is doing. So in, uh, in words, they're actually protecting you more than most of the other providers but they're just telling you what gets shared because they feel that's better to have it as a clean slate out there. But the uh, Google makes their money by you seeing ads. When you do a Google search, it gets paid for on the ads. And that's what we pay for having free. It's kind of like the old free TV scenario. You know, you had to watch the commercials to get free over the air TV before the whole DVR and all that. So um, they do the same with mail if you go online. But if you use Apple Mail, you don't see the ads from Google. So just use Apple Mail, it strips it off. Ooh, that reminds me, I gotta show you one thing in Safari that is cool. So I'm gonna go to CNN.com. So the main page on these things is really pretty much like a table of contents. But let's drill down to one of these, <laughs> stores protective, I thought it said cup at first. Picture Sports Protective Cup. I was kind of saying, what do they wear them on the outside? All right, so you'll notice this reader up here is grayed out. When I go to the article, 
reader gets highlighted. So look at all this stuff. Oh, when you're not cool, you're hungry. Uh, Snickers, all this other stuff. 360, uh, I don't like all that. So look what happens when I click reader. I get clean, unadulterated article. You won't find that everywhere, but anytime it's available, it'll show reader up here. Okay, if we go back to the, and, and by the way, to print it is really clean from there. If I hit Command P, look how clean that is to print. You don't get all that other garbage. And the other thing is, I can make my text larger right within this, or smaller. That would be really handy on the iPhone, wouldn't it? So let's go back a screen, and you'll notice on the main page, which is a whole bunch of articles, reader is not active because there's no blue up there. I have to go to an article and say, boom. Now hopefully reader will show up. Yep, now reader shows up, and look how clean that makes it. All right, so now that would be really handy on the iPhone or the iPad, and it's available there. I'll show you how it is. It's more particularly good on the iPhone. And if I go to Safari, I'll go to CNN.com again. And you can see here on the main page it isn't. So I'm going to say, uh, World, oh, I don't want to do World Cup. Oh, wait, that's not on right now. It's not till 3. I didn't want to do a, a spoiler here. So it's loading the page. And now in the upper left-hand corner, you see those lines? When I tap that, it's the same thing of Reader. And especially on the iPhone, I can decide to make the text bigger. Oops. Where is the bigger and smaller? Oh, come on. I didn't want to make that. This might be a particular page. Oh, it's loading the next page. Wow. Sorry. They've just recently taken that out. But anyway, see how much cleaner that is? I know another little trick. Watch this. He hasn't prepared any differently for the game in Manaus. I had it read it to me. Highlight it, press and hold, and hit speak. All right. Get you, I would I mean, you guys all raise your hand with iPhones. Uh, I would use Siri. Siri is the bomb. It makes you, I can do things, in fact, here, I should pull that up. Let's see if it'll let me do it. Airplay. Oh, that went on again. I'm drunk. Don't expect me to get you home. So Siri takes artificial intelligence and instead of typing I'm drunk, and then interestingly enough, call me a taxi is geographically based taxi service to right here. Oops. Well, I need a jacket today. Oh. Well, I need a jacket today. It searched Lanita jacket. Give me directions to Sacramento International Airport. Give me directions to Sacramento International Airport. Sacramento International Airport. Oh, it did. Because I'm doing GPS on it, but. Find In and Out Burger on my route. I found two restaurants along your In and Out Burger very close to you. Along my route. So if you have Bluetooth in your car, or you have any type of headset or Bluetooth, 
it will actually, when I tell it to send someone an email or a text, it will read it back to me too. I can say, send Pete Losey a text message. Send Pete Losey a text message. Okay, what do you want to say to Pete Losey? Don't forget to record pages, please. Ready to send it? Yes, send it. Okay, I'll send it. What does the fox say? Siri is fun, and it, you can, it's really amazing what you can do with it. You could say, what time does USA Soccer play today? The United States, Portugal game starts at 3 p.m. 